I'm John Atak, as people who watch this channel probably know by now. And this is Catherine Spolino, who has recently published an excellent book called The Bad Cadet about her wonderful childhood in Scientology. I think I'm being a little bit sarcastic there about her dreadful childhood in Scientology. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's a pleasure. It's a, yeah, and for me. Um, I, I didn't think I was going to read this book. I thought, you know, I'll just do an interview and we'll get away with it. And I started reading it and I went, this is really, really well written. Oh, wow. um, it, 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 you know, it's a page turner. You keep going. It, it, there's nothing abstract or elaborate or difficult about it. It's a very straightforward story. And you're not sort of carping. It's not an embittered mem memoir. Yeah. So yeah. I think, I was, uh, sorry, you could keep going. No, I, I, I think you have reasons to be bitter, given the, the childhood that you had. Um, but it, it, you were born into the Sea Organization. And uh, through the 1990s, you were involved with the Cadet Org. Um, so you were a kind of live-in Sea Org member. Uh, the first question that comes to me is, is what is your relationship? Because your parents were both Sea Org members and you barely ever saw them. So what, what's the situation with your parents now? Um, unfortunately, they did disconnect from me. Um, for um, it's, it's a silly reason. My two friends were on Leah Remini show and I had kept in contact with my family. My parents were really good about staying in contact. They knew I wasn't a Scientologist, but there was like, don't say anything negative. We're all good. Mm -hmm. As long as I, you know, don't speak out against Scientology, they could see me was like the known rule kind of, it was, it was, um, so like, if I said anything ever, even slightly negative, like about you guys don't get enough time off or anything that, you know, they've come to the defense. So I was always very good at just trying to keep it chill because I wanted them to have a relationship with my kids at the time. I had a three-year-old and baby twins, but then my friends were on, went on the show and they found out about it and they knew about my, uh, that I was good friends with them. They were both at my wedding. Like that's how close we were. So then they were so upset about it. And I'm like, but you don't have, why would you expect me to tell somebody who's not even my husband or wife to not go on a show if they have a truth they want to share? Like, that's not my, my thing. Like, why would you think I have to tell you that they're doing that? Like, I just don't think that would be right. And so from there, they're like, well, we don't feel comfortable. And you've said comments here and there, which I admit to, like, I would say here and there, and then I would stop. Like I compared the Sea Org to 1984 once, <laughs> the novel to my sister, because she told me she was reading it. She's still in the Sea Org. And I said, don't you find it? Big Brother is very interesting to the Sea Org. And she did not like that. <laughs> so she brought that up in the conversation. She was the one who called me. And then she said, we need some time apart. And so I guess that's what they're saying now instead of disconnection. And I'm apart. I haven't, yeah. And I haven't heard from them again for like four years. And my brother who lives here, he moved to Minneapolis and he's not a Scientologist and he didn't believe me. And I was like, I don't think they're, I think they've disconnected and they didn't even call him. And that was it. We just, I haven't heard from them. So from there I was like, okay, like I had this idea of this book. I've been working on it, but I never was like, I can't really publish this because I don't want to lose my family, mm -hmm. but then I lost them anyway. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to write this book. And, uh, Turns out there's two books because one book is the growing up part in the Sea Org and at the ranch, which is through a young me. It's like through my, my eyes and I'm not angry because I didn't know any better. So it's a story of how much I love Alan Hubbard and how much I believe in everything. But then there's all these things happening and it's what does a young girl do as she starts to realize that things aren't quite what she wants and how do you how does she sort that out is mm. she being me and then um yeah and then second story would be following leaving the sea org and starting to be in the real world you know quote unquote and being around wogs and what's that like and who do i believe now <laughs> scientology or wogs you know let, let, so let, me, let, me, let, let me just uh, insert here that the, the term wog which is a uh, like the n-word where i live mm -hmm and a term of abuse. Oh no, I'm sorry. Um, no, that, no, that's fine. It's a, it's Hubbard adopted the term knowing that. It's it's an English, mm -hmm. a British mm -hmm. English term. And so he knew that it, it meant anybody with, with colored skin, fundamentally oh, wow. in, this, 
And uh, my first experience of the word, I, I got in Scientology and a few days later, I moved into a flat with a guy who was a Scientologist. And I said, is there anything you don't like? And he said, wogs. And I'm sort of, oh, wow. but a couple of my best friends are Indian, you know? <laughs> and he was like, oh, no, no, God. it doesn't mean that. I just don't like non-Scientologists. And that was a, of itself, a very weird thing to say, I felt, to have separated himself in that way. What you say about 1984, um, when uh, Robert Vaughan Young came out of Scientology, having been their top PR for 20 years, he announced Hubbard's death. He was the keeper of the Hubbard archives. And he said, you know, 1984 is the model of the Sea Org. It de describes Soviet Russia under Stalin and Scientology under Aaron Hubbard. And I do yeah. sort of, you know, if, if you look at what you've written and you say, well, let's transpose this to the world. If Ron Hubbard and David Miscavige, the Sea Organization, we're running the world, what would the world be like? Yeah. You know, and it would be like, I think your description of it is pretty much the way it would be, where people are expected to adulate Ron Hubbard and uh, in, in every action they do, you know, what would Ron do? How, how would Ron behave in the situation? Mm -hmm. What is was it? it? What did you say? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the things that really shocked me, I was a nine-year member, but I was never a live-in member. I was never on staff, let alone in the Sea Org. And um, because, you know, I'm a writer and an artist, a musician, I was treated as a celebrity, even though I didn't have, you know, the money. So I was treated with kid gloves. And coming away and finding out the horrific treatment that Sea Organization members were receiving, you know, they're expected to work 15 hours a day um pretty much seven days a week they might get a mm -hmm. liberty on a saturday morning every couple of weeks if they're good and that that was concealed from the public and you know i'm shocked and horrified that your parents have taken the position they've taken and i think it shows that that we're dealing with with a dangerous organization because it prevents people from communicating and if you look at it and you unpack it if your parents had stayed in touch with you you wouldn't have written this book yeah i know that's the catalyst it's wild uh, i wonder if you have a copy of your book to hand grand uh, and I, I wonder if you would mind reading out the forward for us forward a midwife delivered me in a small room in a four-story apartment building on hollywood boulevard the luminescent bright green Scientology sign outside my window reflected off the Hollywood stars that lined the sidewalk below. I was a Sea Org baby. My parents had dedicated their lives to the Church of Scientology and its Sea Org, and in doing so, dedicated my life as well. Instead of being raised by my parents, my brothers and sister and I were trained among a couple hundred other Sea Org children to be the future leaders of Scientology. I was a cadet and I was going to help save the planet. If only I could follow the rules. If only you could follow the rules. <laughs> um, and so you, you have uh, two brothers and a sister? I have two brothers and a sister. Unfortunately, one of my brothers died. Um, very sad story, and that was something that happened after I left the Sea Org, and he was in the Sea Org when he passed uh, from a sickness um bad cancer and a lot of that was a big part of me coming out of Scientology and that would be in my second book because there was a lot of at the beginning blame where I was the why of why he was being sick super dark it's uh um very shocking because mm -hmm. I had nothing to do with it he just happened to be sick but because I was an ex Sea Org member they decided it was my fault and then they changed their mind after a few months but for a while there it was what was called a, under a non-interpolation order where my parents and my sister and my brother could not talk to me and I could not talk to them. And I was about to turn 21. So that was very, very devastating. And then I had to take a couple of years to process that, but that was a big crack where things really started to open up for me for, regarding Scientology itself. Because one thing I don't know if people realize is when you leave the Sea Org, a lot of times, you still really believe in Scientology. You just feel like you can't be in the Sea Org. So mm -hmm. what happens there? Some people stay, they leave the Sea Org and they stay a Scientologist and they somehow avoid all the media and they avoid anything that's negative about Scientology. 
or you can actually start to take your blinders off and really do some research and learn and grow around from the people around you, which is what happened with me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when I, I left in 1983, so a long time ago, no internet, no World Wide Web. Um, libraries had had copies of Scientology books stolen from them. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed, my, my book, Let's Sell All These People a Piece of Blue Sky, uh, the British Librarian magazine said it was the most stolen book in British libraries. Mm -hmm. 200 <laughs> copies were lost. Oh, um gosh. In Portland, Oregon, I think they lost nine copies in the first year, and in Tampa, six copies in the first year. So the point being that to try and find, you know, Robert Kaufman's Inside Scientology or Cyril Vosper's Mindbenders or Paulette Cooper's Scandal of Scientology, there were plenty of good books written, but you couldn't find them because they'd been stolen and destroyed. With the internet, everything changed. People could mm -hmm. suddenly post anonymously. And of course, the great breakthrough was ARS, mm -hmm. um, Alt Religion Scientology, where you know, suddenly there were thousands of people complaining about this. But that sort of the echo chamber of Scientology, where, where as you say, people will leave the organization and they'll feel guilty. They'll feel they weren't good enough. Um, and then they'll pay their freeloader bill, you know, the bill mm -hmm. for all of the the training they've supposedly had, which is not offset at all uh, against the what you were getting about fifteen dollars a week as a cadet for a week's yeah. work. Yeah, and then in the Sea Org, it's uh, like thirty-two or something. But even then, there would be times they didn't make enough money in the org, and they would only give Sea Org members half pay, mm. so it wasn't even guaranteed. So, and, and for that in the Sea Org, you're working an eighty or ninety-hour week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah so uh, do you think your brother's cancer might have been treatable um was his cancer treated Is was it was, was it treatable i mean yeah so been they, outside of the sea did, it... yeah so they did actually um he went was at the city of hope in pasadena and got really good treatment so oh, thankfully good. i don't know like um if it could have been caught sooner or not that part i'm not aware of but he was constantly going into the hospital before he was like okay we need to do a bone marrow transplant where the doctors recommended it and that's where they were like oh okay you guys could talk to Catherine now because we could see if she's a match and they're like never mind everything that happened and i was like do i get an apology <laughs> anything no <laughs> you just you get to talk to your parents again just be quiet no that's the gist of it so i just was like glad to be with my family and wanted to be there with my brother while he was going through what he was going through um mm -hmm. but he i think the government paid for it i think he was on medicaid or medicare um mm -hmm. and he got the best care but unfortunately he did end, end up passing about a year or so later yeah when i left uh, through 1984 we we were very concerned at the amount of uh, cancer cases in Scientology, which is why I ask about treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I worked, there was, you know, I, with the first I was at the middle of the independent movement, which was just beginning then. And a few months on, after nine years of being a true believer, I saw enough material about Hubbard to understand that the man was a liar. Mm -hmm. And that that was not, well, as he said, honesty is sanity. Um, so let's use his own measure to judge him and that the lies were often contradictions in his own statement. So it wasn't that somebody was saying that he'd said something that was not true. It was him saying, you know, I was a wounded war hero in my philosophy. And yet in a, a piece called Communication and Isness in the 50s, he'd said that he beat up three petty officers um, on the 25th of July, 1945. So crippled and blinded in Oakdale Hospital. Yeah. but three weeks before the war ended, he was physically capable of beating three men up. Um, mm -hmm. And it is true, he did get into a fight with two petty officers, not three. Um, I did find that out along the way. But we, my friend Steve Bisbee, who, who was an independent Scientologist, came to me and said, you know, we've got an awful lot of OTs who are dying of cancer. And so we start, we spent the year and went through one story after another. And 
his thought was that maybe Scientology processing was causing the cancer because of the kind of magical thinking that goes along with Scientology. And I came to the conclusion that, and there were, there were a lot of people who'd done the upper levels of Scientology who were dying of cancer. Um, and I came to the conclusion that it was nothing to do with, you know, the OT levels or, or, or any of that mm -hmm. thing, which I, can certainly affect you, your mental health quite severely, I would think. Um, yeah. But it was because they were not receiving treatment early enough because they were believing that they could audit it off. A man called Bram McKee, who was in Scientology for a very long time and testified at the Clearwater hearings in 1982, and he said that his wife got cancer and they went to the flag land base in Florida and were, were given a card for somewhere like the Hoxie Clinic, you know, one of these Mexican clinics and when they went there they arrived they went into the waiting room and he said the waiting room was full of Scientology OTs trying to get this wow. kind of hokum treatment so um so your other brother is is now living yeah where you are he, and he did he ended up moving I left LA with my boyfriend at the time now husband who is not a Scientologist who I met when I was 20, mm. 21. And he has family in Minnesota. And so eventually we moved here. So then eventually my brother had visited and he liked it and he wanted to kind of get out of LA. And so he lives here, which is nice to have. But he's, not is, a he's not. Yeah. And, and your sister? My sister is still in the Sea Org. I haven't heard from her since that phone call where she said that they needed space from me. So that was, and I never even talked to my mom or my dad about like anything. So that was, I think, so I have twins and they were about a year old. So I think it's been about five years. Oh. I keep thinking it was three or four, but I think it's actually five, which is crazy. Mm. Time flies, which is really sad because they had come out, my parents and my sister, when my twins were born and were really sweet and loved, like you could just see their faces. They loved these little babies and my three-year-old and they, and they were so you know they were really dedicated so i always like they won't be that family that'll disconnect like hopefully like if they're told to disconnect from me maybe they'll put up a fight but no it's like i mean i assume they didn't put up a fight i don't really know what happened but so that was they chose to not talk to me anymore just because my friends i mean i think that bottom line they knew that i basically agreed with my friends and that was mm -hmm. really what it is but it's like you could still have a relationship with somebody and disagree about things. And that, and I guess they can't, and we know that the CR can't do that or Scientologists can't do that. If you disagree with Scientology, you can't be their friend or family. No, no it's not permitted. And, and it is, I mean, I've dealt with quite a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses and they too have shunning and disfellowshipping and um, mm -hmm. all sorts of strange things. I gave a talk in St. Petersburg about 10 years ago and I was it still shocks me the thought you know I understand when children don't talk to their parents you know that can happen uh, it's not a good thing but it can happen yeah. but I as a parent I have four kids I don't believe I have the right to not communicate with my children I, I think that by having a child you have that responsibility and so hearing of these stories in Scientology where people are sort of forced to keep quiet um you know when, when we've got uh our in, inalienable right to communicate according yeah. to ron hubbard that yeah. that there are so many restrictions as so much limitation yeah and, it, and in your case you know i i we tend I, i'm not tremendously active i'm not really active in the counter cult world i, I just talk mm -hmm. to people now but but when i was there was a very noticeable difference between people who were recruited in as adults and people who came in as children. And the, the principal difference is that if you leave later and, and you were 18 or 25 when you got involved, you can go back to what you believed before. But in talking with second generations, born-ins, mm -hmm. you don't have anything to go back to. So how did you... Then you must have had a crisis, and this will doubtless be in your next book. So, uh, you must have had a crisis of belief. And mm -hmm. how did you resolve that? What was it that seemed 
wrong to you about Scientology in the first place? Where you know, was it just a, a whole slew of things? Yeah, it's a great question. And it is a it's a pretty big slew of things. I think one of the things that you'll you probably noticed when I was when you read the book was that I constantly am kind of never really on course and never really like I'm trying to be but I'm kind of bored it's not very interesting to me mm -hmm. so I already had a little bit of a disconnect where mm -hmm. I believed in Alvin Hubbard but I wasn't really using Alvin Hubbard like it wasn't something I, it was something that I didn't find to be actually helpful mm -hmm. <laughs> like I wasn't something I actually used so even when I was a young Scientologist living in LA all of my friends are Scientologists that's just the community you're in I didn't go on course never paid off my freeloader debt so I had these things already in place where I wasn't fully in, but I said I was in. One day I'll pay my courses and get auditing and do this, but it was not a priority. Um, so having that already gave me like a buffer, I think, in my brain, in my mind of like free thought, I think, because I was already putting myself first and like, I don't really like doing this, so I'd rather do this, like not going on course and not paying my free letter debt. Um, but when my brother was sick and they called me, that was very trauma traumatizing. And I definitely, I kind of tried to hold it in. I couldn't talk to anybody, but my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, was not a Scientologist. And he said something to me, which I think anybody who wants to get somebody out of a cult maybe would find this helpful. He said, just so you know, I will never be a Scientologist. It has nothing to do with you, but you can tell me anything because I'm never going to be it. It's just not my thing. I grew up Christian. He doesn't even go to church for Christianity either, but he's just like, it's not, it's not for me. He's like, mm -hmm. so you can tell me, like, don't be worried. Cause I had this thought, if I tell him these negative things, he won't be a Scientologist and he won't get freedom. He won't go up the bridge. But when he said that it was like, oh my gosh, so I could finally talk. So then I, that began many conversations where I could talk about how upset I was about what was happening to me and saying it out loud, I think really helps. And mm -hmm. then he wouldn't say anything negative about the church. So then I wouldn't be defending it. Yeah. He would just listen. And mm. I think that was a huge part of it. So that was starting the big crack. And I started to really think about it and then started to kind of go on the internet, but would like get scared whenever it's a Zenu or something. I was like, oh, you know, because Zenu is a thing where on OT3, they don't want you to know what's on OT3 because it turns out it's about aliens, but Scientologists don't know that. And they say, if you see it ahead of time, it could ruin your chance to go up the bridge, which is so scary. The bridge is like where you get total freedom and you're like the best self that you can be. So for me, going on the internet was very, very out there. None of my friends were doing it. Um, even like now as an adult, like, you know, 20 years later, I've asked them and it took them a while to get to that point. Like they were surprised that at 20 years old, I was already starting to look. And then I took my husband to the basics event boyfriend at the time and just watching it it's a big release event where they have these new books and it was very like buy these books and I was that was the money part clicked mm -hmm. I was like oh they really want to make money and so there was it was about a year or two process of me like observing and researching and I went on Tony Ortega's site mm -hmm. and um the other ones out there I think ex Scientology Kids was up by them by Jenna Miscavige Hill yeah um, and just started to like realize, and I actually, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Miriam, actually, she's in my book. She's the only one from the ranch. I kept her name because she helped me with my editing and she read so many drafts, but she came to visit me and she was, we were both 20, 21. And I'm like, look at this, showing her all this stuff on the internet. And she told me years later that I like scared the crap out of her. She's like, How is she showing me all these things? <laughs> like we're going to get in trouble. But she like didn't report me. And those people I knew just, you know, they wouldn't report me. And mm -hmm. obviously you always run the risk of being reported, but I had just assumed she'd be open to it and just like shocked her with that. And she kind of shoved it in the back of her brain and shut the door. And it wasn't until she was ready personally. And then like down the road where she actually got herself out because you can't just shove this information in someone's face that's another part and say hey look at this what Scientology is doing can't you see people they'll just say no it's lies or like shut huh? it or push it away and ignore it um so yeah, yeah. I, I mean I I was involved in in intervention work for about five years at the beginning of the 90s and um I stopped it because it just the the harassment level just became 
ridiculous, you know, being followed by, we, it was one intervention where we had seven car loads of Scientologists following us. Oh my us. gosh. And um, yeah, it, it just, that got too much, but it, it was interesting in that situation that I'd be sat down with somebody who was a, you know, a, this one guy, he'd, he'd, he'd done his success story in the course room that morning and he was at the intervention in the afternoon. And so he'd been telling everybody how fantastic Scientology was, and there he was now in a room. And you're absolutely right. It's not a matter of of showing somebody external information, which will be just disbelieved and pushed aside. I would show people the thing I mentioned about Hubbard's war wounds, that you you give two Hubbard statements about something. And it, you know, talking with people who've worked with with many other groups, that this is generally a way in and not taking um, a sort of negative attitude in my attitude when somebody hired me for an intervention was to say I'm not here to talk anybody out of Scientology I'm here to offer information that this person won't have so that they can make a better decision and even when people refused to talk to me and that did happen a couple of times um, because I was a declared suppressive person yeah. um, and so they were not allowed to talk to me, even though, of course, on their communication release, they'd learned how to communicate freely with anyone on any subject um, within certain barriers. But even mm -hmm. people who wouldn't talk to me, their family relationship was improved because, you know, you're going into the room and saying, there's, there's stuff you don't know. Um, but largely... I'd be there to say, I'll help you explain your situation to your parents, your friends, whoever, rather than I'm here to dislodge you from this belief. And it it's recognizing how people become involved, that there's a debate at the moment about critical thinking. And many people in the counter cult world, think of Bill and Lorna Goldberg particularly, have advocated critical thinking. And we need to learn how to think properly chris shelton is the critical thinker at large um mm -hmm. and a dear friend of mine and i take a different point of view i think that our reasoning is very easily bypassed and that we then develop a kind of sense of certainty feelings of knowing being sure you know that ron hubbard is um you know the future buddha maitreya and has come to save all of humanity or whatever story we're being sold which resonates with something emotional in us and as you say, it becomes scary to question that. Jesse Prince told me that um, he was the head of all of the tech in the, the 80s, appointed by Hubbard. He told me that he, he bought a copy of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, and he couldn't open it for six years. He didn't wow. got a copy of it, but didn't. And to think how much phobia has been put into somebody to get them to this condition where you know, this whole thing of you mustn't talk to suppressive people because they're more powerful than you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they will overwhelm you with their their evilness. John McMaster, the world's first real clear in 1965, he said to me that in talking with Hubbard, he didn't understand why we didn't just help suppressive people, because surely we'd clear the planet much faster if we got them out of being suppressive, because that was what was in the way. And and Hubbard was, no, we, we've got to push them away and created this strange world in which you, into which you were born and, and through mm -hmm. which you, you lived. Um, mm -hmm. Well, so, yeah, let me, let me look to the book again. I'd, I'd quite like you to read a bit more, if you would, for me. Sure. Um, I, I did make notes. All the way through. As I said, I really didn't expect to, to finish the book. I thought, you know, That's I'll really cool. help you promote it. I was <laughs> worried because I do find it, to me, the market audience does happen to be young women, I think, mm. mass market more. And I don't know if um, I, some people, some Scientologists, especially who, who ex-Scientologists, second generation, might even be a little angry about I was worried they might be because it's super through a child, young a young uh girl's eyes and there are happy moments and it's like what how could she have been happy in here but also a lot of sad moments but i think what did you think of that like the tone of voice i guess of my book i i thought it it, it was appealing be because 
it it's fresh it's natural the way that you're speaking about mm -hmm. your experience and because you're not you know and you had every reason to carp about the things that you were put through but but you have a very level tone you, you're sort of saying well this is what happened this is where it is i mean uh, i'm next week i'm talking with anka richter who's who's published a book called cult trip which is about it's not about scientology at all it's about three sex cults and looking at the childhood that kids had at center point in new zealand i actually felt that your your childhood was not that bad in comparison mm -hmm. um that there were you know it wasn't like being say the children of god you know we, we did that devastating experience but nonetheless it was bad enough it was bad enough to sort of go well you know how do you become a whole person after this i talked with mark Plummer the other week and mm -hmm. i at the end you know he was i think seven years in the sea org in in los angeles and i said well you know how, how about recovery and i think his story is like your story he didn't have any auditing he didn't do any auditor training oh, he trained yeah. on he was a treasury sec and that's what he did so he was able to just put it down and say you know it's not in my head i don't think this way i think perhaps um Page 269, the beginning of the end. Chapter 47, the beginning of the end. Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. I jolted when I realized my name was being shouted across the room. What? I said, confused. I had been standing at muster, lost in thought, but I was jerked back to the present. I was surrounded by ASHA Foundation SEERG members inside the executive's office, where our muster was being held due to the pouring rain outside. The captain pointed at me from the front of the room. This is the type of out ethics that we shouldn't be allowing in the org. Catherine stands there looking at her nails as if she has something better to do, he said, his brown mustache bristling up in a sneer. We are trying to clear the planet. Is that something you might be interested in? I was at my first Asho muster in two weeks. I've been enjoying the last couple of weeks sleeping in, slacking off in our dorm, and occasionally doing a project with Casey and Leslie. I had moved out of my Asho dorm into theirs. But today, I wasn't in my dorm reading or listening to music. Unfortunately, Bertha had tracked me down in my dorm and informed me that I was required to be in uniform and go to muster, even though I was on the decks. I hated pretending to be a part of the group. I had been standing in the back of the muster, leaning on the wall while the captain of Asho Foundation lectured the organization about what gross income targets needed to be met. Since this had nothing to do with me, I had let my mind wander, but now I was fully present. Everyone was looking at me. I stared at the captain. Where did this hatred for me come from? My encounters with the captain were few, but each time he had always been kind and curious to me, even recently when I was in ethics trouble. But now, suddenly, he was coming at me in front of the whole Asheville Foundation staff. Well, he sneered at me, are you interested in clearing the planet or not? Yes, I said, drawing the word out. Yes, what, he demanded. Yes, sir. I loaded my words with contempt. This was bullshit. Why was I being singled out? The captain turned his attention away from me and continued his lecture while I simmered in anger. I knew he was under a lot of pressure to get the ash of St. Hill's side because he was being shadowed by two personnel from the Religious Technology Center, the highest organization in the Sea Org. There was a list of goals we needed to accomplish and we kept missing our targets. I had a feeling the captain was taking out his frustration on me. When he dismissed the org, I pushed myself off the filing cabinet, ready to book it out the door and back to my dorm. But too late, the captain was striding over to me. What the hell is your problem? He screamed at me. He was tall and lanky with a graying mustache, not the toughest looking guy around. And now here he was, trying to intimidate me. Didn't he know I was from the ranch? Were we a Mr. Hammond, the scariest dude around as our cadet coordinator? I don't know what you're talking about, I glared at him. His face turned red. I leaned against the wall with the bored expression on my face as he started screaming, saying what a degraded being I was, how disgusting I was, that I need to get back on purpose. His words landed like soft pebbles against the bubble I had built around myself. It was like I was in a movie watching this happen to someone else. As the captain leaned in closer, spit sprayed out of his mouth and landed on my cheek. I reached up and wiped it away with my hand, staring at it with disgust. Say it, don't spray it, jeez. Bertha, who had been standing behind the captain, shook her head at me. I couldn't believe I had said it myself, but I couldn't take it back. 
The captain pulled himself to his full height and turned to Bertha. I want her court of ethics done today. And how, how old were you then? I was 15. 15 years old. And, and what you'd experienced is a severe reality adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, an expression I only learned at the end of my time in Scientology when uh, a former senior Hubbard aide who I was employing decided to give my wife a, a severe reality adjustment. And um, it was very shocking. In nine years, I'd never experienced this. And then finding this was, you know, when I sat down with him and said, why did you do this? Where is it written? If it isn't written, it isn't true. Where is it written yeah. that you do this? He said, it isn't written anywhere. And I said, well, why do you do it? And he put his head in his hands and said, because Hubbard did it to us every day. And my idea, you know, I was still involved in Scientology at this time. It's the last year of my involvement. Sort of, mm -hmm. so this great, wonderful, compassionate human being spends his time screaming at people and ripping out any confidence that they have in themselves that this mm -hmm. is very much a part of the process that that people are degraded, people are pushed into a humiliated situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so and it, how do you feel about Scientology now? You know, how would you describe it to a stranger? I would, I would say it's a, um, a group that portrays itself as a religion, but it's not. Since it doesn't really believe in a god. It believes in Elmer Hubbard, but he's just a person who made up some stories, um, and that they have way too much control on its members. And it's very sad that the members are told who to like, who to associate with. And that these members will say that's not true, but it is because I've lost my family from it. I mean, that's yes. just the same version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've, it's, you know, it's what 1974 when I first became involved with it. So I've had quite a lot of time to think about it, and have met way more than a thousand people um, over the years, and have been involved in the recovery of about 600. Mm -hmm. in that time you know directly and of course i dug into the history of the group because there wasn't a history um there was a sociologist roy wallace's road to total freedom which is a very good assessment of the first four years from 50 to 54 and when i interviewed him he, he said he'd run out of money to do his phd so he only got to 1954 so i brought it up to 1990 and I think it's one of the most remarkable stories of our time, that in the 20th century, there, there are a few people. You have this, when Hubbard was asked in uh, 1968, um, there's, there's a wonderful little documentary called The Shrinking World of Aaron Hubbard. It's on my channel. Um, and it was made for Granada TV in 68. And this guy, Charlie Nairn, 25 years old, rolls up at Bizerte to interview Ron Hubbard at one o'clock in the morning. And Hubbard's walking up and down the deck. And so he asks permission to come aboard and he gets aboard. And he pretty soon they're having a casual conversation. And Charlie says to him, it's a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard says, well, yes, of course. And so Charlie says, it must be really hard for you having to keep that hidden. You know, when you go after the narcissist, you think mm -hmm. about how much trouble they're having. And Hubbard was, yes, it is. It's a hard life that I have. And so Charlie said to him, why do you do it? And he said, well, it's good to be able to give your wife $10,000 every day, which in 1968 is more like $100,000 now. But what I really like is to catch the clever ones and reel them in. And I, when Charlie told me this story about five or six years ago, I was sort of, so that's what it was. He was a 10-year-old child who never grew up and who lived in this crazy fantasy world and then drew you know tens of thousands of people into that fantasy world so that they really believe that that they're going to get superpowers that they're they're going to be able to do anything and everything they want and there is absolutely no evidence of it you know that yeah. instead you've got a pretty much a gulag a labor camp yeah well i remember growing up reading you know, Have You Lived Before the Slave, the book of all those like past life stories. And that was amazing. You're like, oh my gosh, one day I will get to learn about all my past lives, which makes you feel pretty important. Mm -hmm. And then 
reading the OT magazines from ALA and the things where they were, they were running late and they turn on the light screen. It's like, I don't like, did this happen? I doubt it, but they have all these stories of selling this magic basically. And it yeah. was like, and I believed it. I'm like, oh my gosh, when you're OT, you can control things. Hmm. And you do believe it. I mean, you know, I, you know, I was grown up. I was 19 when I came to Scientology. I, I, my critical thinking was in pretty good shape. You know, I'd read my, my Plato and stuff like that. And yet, and in fact, the first thing I did the day I turned up, because I, I read the first half of Science of Survival and then went and found them. And um, when I went there, so, you know, nobody recruited me or anything like that. So I went there and when I said I was a Buddhist, I was given two copies of Advance magazine uh, saying that Hubbard was Maitreya, the future Buddha. Oh, yeah, that's right. And the first thing I did was write a letter that day to the Pali Text Society to see if these predictions were true, that um, this man would be born in the West, he'd have red hair, and it'd be two and a half thousand years after the Buddha. And they came straight back to me and said, no, none of these things is true. The, the legend of Maitreya or Maitreya it comes from the Book of the Great Decease, which is a part of the Pali Canon, the, the sutras. And quite evidently, it's written after the Buddha's death, because the Great Decease is the death of the Buddha. And the idea is that, yes, there will in the future be this being. But they added in these details saying this is the truth. So I started Scientology from the perspective that it was not necessarily truthful. Um, okay. But I desperately wanted emotional equanimity i'd been through a bad breakup with a girlfriend and i just didn't want to feel that distressed and they seemed to be offering a way to overcome that and uh, which never happened we never in nine years and we never addressed that upset it just went away you know you it, time passes and you realize that that wouldn't you know i realized it wouldn't have been a very good idea for her or for me for us to mm -hmm. stay together and i found somebody else but the being starting from a point of view where anything magical, anything supernatural, because I'd come from the Zen Buddhist community, is called Gedo Zen. It's considered mm -hmm. to be a bad thing. You know, you don't go near anything that's magical. And here I was suddenly, you know, or gradually, in fact, involved in this thing that was going to give me superpowers. And the idea that there is never any demonstration of that. The success stories that were reprinted in advance, the editor of advance later said, admitted that he'd written them all because he was sure that they'd happened to somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they were fabrications. And, you know, I, because I had, I've had the opportunity of talking with more than a thousand ex-Scientologists or some of them still Scientologists when I talk to them, I have yet to hear anything any single demonstration of a past life experience, for example. So somebody's saying, you know, I, I was there at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And you go, and what dialect did you speak then? Speak to mm -hmm. us in the, the French or the English of that time, which is markedly different. There's never anything. I had a friend yeah. um, who, he was in Scientology for less than a year, but he, the ideas completely took him over. And he, for years, worked on this past life he'd had and this town where he'd lived. And he wrote down all of this stuff. And eventually his wife, who was not interested in this kind of thing, said, let's go there. And he said when he got to the town, nothing was as he'd written, not a single thing. You know, so this capacity to make false memories and um, view the world in a, you know, through the lens of L. Ron Hubbard's craziness, really. Mm -hmm. You know, he was... A, a sick man he, he spent all of his life suffering from different ailments all of the list of things that he said he, you could cure with dianetics in uh, the mental science of modern health as i've decided to retitle it all of the things that, that he lists in there he suffered from so he was short-sighted he had bursitis in his right shoulder um which is the lubrication of the muscle joint yeah um he had asthma till he died um and of course he was a heavy smoker 100 cigarettes and, a day and he took psychiatric drugs too right or something he he admitted to having been addicted to barbiturates there's a lecture 
I wrote a paper called Never Believe a Hypnotist, which has his admissions of taking amphetamines and barbiturates. Um, we also have evidence that he took an opiate called Demerol. Um, and he seems to have, have, you know, had a pretty heavy duty relationship with addictive and dangerous drugs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yet the delusion is attractive to people. We, mm -hmm. we want to believe such things. And, and I think the place where he scored was rather than having a, a puritanical, what seems to be a puritanical belief system, he said, you're a God, you can do anything. All you have to do is give money to me and, and you will get there. And yeah. instead you get this absolutely crazy situation. Do you think that, do you think that Scientology will come to an end at any point? Do you think that the members will ever be able to leave? You know, I wish I could say like, Yes, but I really don't know. Like, I think they have so much money and they've created such an insular environment for these Sierra members who are having, or Scientologists who are having kids. There are a couple of things that you say that that I'm just going to read out here, that, that when you were 15 years old, you, you moved so that you could work at the organization where your mom was. And you make the comment, um, it was nice to be able to see my mom every day for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's an incredibly poignant statement, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's certainly from my perspective, and I'm sure from yours, being separated from your children is, mm -hmm. is it, you know, what a, what a terrible thing to do to people to yeah. force them into that situation and how awful for the children. Yeah, um, and it's just amazing to me. I asked my mother later after I left the Sea Org, what made you send me to the ranch? I'm just curious. And she said she thought it was like the best situation. I'm, she's going to put me somewhere safe. They provide for me. Little did she know that they did not. Mm -hmm. um, and that they would be around something she believed in. So for her, she thought she was doing really good by me and putting me in a safe space and where I would be, I mean, she assumed taken care of, but. I don't, it was very, it's very strange as an adult now and, and having children to, and I'm like, I would never, ever send my children away like that. And I love them so much. And I give so much attention to them. Like the amount of like, um, right now they're sick and I'm like, do you need water? Like just the amount of care I give them. And I'm like, when I'm sick, it's like off to the corner, you know, clean up your own puke. And it's just a mess mm. at the ranch. So it's just, it's um, that part when I became a mother it was when I really became aware of how sad it really was yes. of how much neglect I had because you don't know really until you have your own children and you see how much love and you have them and how much you want to take care of them and how much your mind you want you want to nurture them. Yeah, I am back in well, 1988. I was in the US for a couple of weeks doing some work and. A friend there um, mm -hmm. had an estate in Hawaii, and he said, why don't you come to Hawaii for a couple of weeks when you're done here? I'll pay for everything. The right kind of friend to have, obviously. <laughs> and I just I just went, no, I, I've got to be home. I've got to see my children. Two weeks away is, is the most I can manage. And my children were very young at that. You know, my first two kids were very young. But yeah, that thought of... of being willing to be separated. There's another point you make where you're basically saying that you want to leave the C organization. Mm -hmm. And and you say to your mom, um, and your mom and dad, don't you guys want grandkids one day? My mom peered at me, then shrugged. I'd prefer you stay in the C org. Yeah. What a terrible yeah. thought, you know? Yeah. I was I was definitely, I remember being like, really mom? And I say that in the book, but like what like how do you not want grandkids mm. and it's just and then she's like well, you know says what she says or she's like well it'd be nice but i'd rather yeah you'd be dedicated to clearing the world basically mm. and that's how much bigger the purpose of the sea org what they do to the sea org members the sea org is more important than themselves and their family unit like that's what it comes down to yeah i mean you're you're told when you get into scientology that that you will achieve self-determinism you will be in charge of yourself. The locus of control will be with you. 
And then when you sign a sealed contract, you promise that you'll follow and uphold command intention for a thousand million years. So the Millions promise of, of self-determinism <laughs> evaporates fairly. Yes. And the freedom of thought, that part just like kills me. I'm like, they don't have the, free, like, the biggest thing they always say is Scientologists have freedom of thought. And I'm like, you have no freedom of thought. It's very sad. Oh. No, I mean, for me, after nine years involved, the, the first year after I left and you know, within months, I'd stopped believing in Hubbard. I'd stopped believing in the technology of Scientology or any of it. And I felt so liberated. I felt I no longer had to conform my thinking to anybody else's ideas. And I was able, you know, at that point, I decided I had to sort of chuck all of Scientology overboard. Uh, and I had, in fact, found out about overboarding by that time, which was a little bit shocking, mm -hmm. Hubbard throwing people off his ship yeah. into the sewage in Corfu Harbour, Harbour from like 25 to 40 oh feet up, you know. Yeah. Uh, horrifying, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. he took photos of it and published them in the Auditor number 41 for anybody who wants to see if what I say is true. But I decided to throw Scientology overboard because it didn't seem possible to believe any part of it and assess the rest of it accurately. So I stopped mm -hmm. believing. And I, you know, I'd done the data series evaluators course. So, you know, I knew all about logic. And I sort of thought, so I'll look at it piecemeal and I'll take back what makes sense. I haven't taken back anything in 39 years mm -hmm. because anything that did seem valuable, he'd stolen from somebody else. You know, I, I, yeah. The paper on on this site um, called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, possibly not my best title, but where I connected things he'd said to show that not only did he use ideas from other places, but he acknowledged that the you know the source of those ideas, even such people as Alistair Crowley. Um, yeah, and it, you just it's interesting. I love that you have that. Um article because on the L. L. Ron Hubbard life exhibition it shows him studying with all these like philosophers Buddhists all these things I'm like oh that's where he got his ideas <laughs> but just, like got it from all these people one of the thing, one of the some documents came out through um Jerry Armstrong's first case in 1984 in Los Angeles and I thought until 2015 when Jerry spoke the an event I conference we we had in toronto but i thought that it, jerry had put these into evidence along with various other documents and he said no scientology put them into evidence and these were three teenage journals two of them handwritten one a retype so this showed exactly what hubbard was doing when he was studying with gurus in india china tibet and mongolia all of those places are claimed by him he didn't visit mongolia he was wasn't in India until the fifties when he changed planes in Calcutta once, wow. um, and I don't think there are any gurus in Mongolia. I don't know, but uh, cer he certainly wasn't in Tibet. And you yeah. find out that he had two teenage holidays in China because his dad was uh, posted on Guam Island with the Navy, which is halfway between China and the US. So they went on holiday. And so you've got this, this is the only chance we've got for him having studied with gurus. And in those diaries, and they're extensive, there are several hundred pages, the only mention of anything religious is a visit to a lamasari, a, a Buddhist monastery. And he's, he, I think, distills all of the wisdom of the East into the monk's voices sounded like bullfrogs. That's his entire okay. study with gurus. Then you've got that he was a nuclear physicist and he himself admits in a lecture in uh, September 1950, Introduction to Dianetics, that he failed. He got an F grade in atomic and molecular physics. He never studied nuclear physics, which is a diff different thing from atomic. But he failed in atomic and molecular. So yeah. he's a scientist. He, he's a, And then he's a war yeah. hero. And you go, he never saw action in World War II. That was a big part of what got me out of Scientology was just seeing all these lies on the internet, like with documents. And I was just like, oh my gosh, if he's lying about himself, then what is everything built upon? And I think I had come across your book because I feel like I remember seeing a piece of let, that quote, let me sell them a piece of blue sky. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, he just wants to make money. <laughs> like, So it's just very, um, it just when, you know, all of that 
information is now available on the internet and having those books, but to see when so somebody who could just make up these bald faced lies about mm -hmm. that, and he writes science fiction, of course, like this, come put it together and he's made up his whole, um, he made up a religion and it's like wild. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the science fiction came towards the end of his period as a pulp writer. He was writing mm -hmm. cowboy stories and That's foreign right. legion stories under all sorts of different names for a penny a word and only mm -hmm. just scraping by because he, he had a pretty extravagant lifestyle and very rarely paid his bills. One of the things in his Navy files and the 800 pages in the Navy file um, is where he was in Australia and he, there are bills that are being sent by tailors to the Navy saying he didn't, he, he had a new uniform made and he didn't pay. So people are chasing him all over the world, trying to get him to pay up. He, he was a, <laughs> A dishonorable and a di dishonest man um mm -hmm. and yet managed to create this you know, scientology is seen richard dawkins has called it a religion uh, amazon lists it as a religion and you go but they've actually got about twenty five thousand members in the international association of scientologists that's it and mm -hmm. i've seen internal membership figures so i'm confident about those those numbers it's never had more than a hundred thousand members and mm -hmm. while claiming to have seven, eight, nine, eleven million, I think they're counting all the little body thetans that, that you Yeah. Do you well. think it will ever shut down? What do you think? I think that it it's gonna be like Christian science and theosophy, that um in nineteen twenty nine, Krishnamurti, who was the elected messiah by mm -hmm. theosophy, turned round and, and said, There is no path, there is no teacher. And he disbanded the Order of the Star at the center of it, and I think gave away a lot of their money. And it sort of, you know, there are still theosophists, but, you know, it's a tiny thing. With Christian science, um, again, it, it was these were very powerful movements at the beginning of the 20th century, very much the Scientology of their time. And they've withered so that you can go to a Christian science reading room and there'll be an 85-year-old woman who will show you the books or something like that. I think Scientology will peter out. Yeah. Um, I'm as concerned about the independents because, you know, while many of them are decent, good-hearted people, there are also some very nasty movements like Avatar. Um, mm -hmm. And Scientology is leaked into the world, you know, in the early 90s, a friend and I listed 200 splinter groups um, no. that, you know, Ampronistics, Dianology, the Enlightenment Intensive, Ekankar, Darfri, John, just one after another guru who had done then Earhart with Earhart Seminar Training, uh, EST, Landmark, The Forum. Um, they've taken ideas from Hubbard and and used them. And the problem is that Hubbard's ideas are really about how to control people. And he's mm -hmm. he's quite open about that. You're going to learn infinite control, 8C. You're going to learn to be able to control people's minds without their consent. And there are those of us who think that even if you could do that, and to some extent you can, but not by any magical means, but there are ways of getting people to believe things so that they will act in a certain way. You know, so your mom and dad have believed the worst thing there is to, to abandon their own child, to, mm -hmm. to not see their grandchildren. How do you persuade somebody of something like that? Well, Elrond Hubbard's there to, to give you the reasons for it. You've got to clear the planet. That's the important mm -hmm. bit. You mustn't waste time. Um, and, it, and then you look at him at the end of his life in his mobile home with attache cases piled to the ceiling each one of them with $100,000 in, in case he has to run away. And you're sort of mm -hmm. going, but I thought hiding was minus eight on the tone scale, Ron. You know, yeah. why are you in hiding? You know, mm -hmm. and he had dementia at the end. He was he was just coming apart. So this, this mm -hmm. the whole thing is bogus. So I was talking with a friend on Monday who worked for Hubbard. And he was talking about a friend of his who, We'll, we'll limit the playing field. I don't want to name him, but he was an executive director international of Scientology. And he said one day, Hubbard said to him, so what do you think Scientology is for? And this guy said, oh, it's to free people. 
And Hubbard said, no, it's to make money. And so he yeah. looked at Hubbard and said, oh, I see what you mean. It's to make money so that we can free people. And Hubbard said, no, it's to make money. <laughs> and that indeed is the stated governing policy of Scientology. Make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make even more money. And yet this notion that it's somehow a religion where, you know, it, it isn't. It's a money-making scam. Hubbard died with $648 million that he hadn't managed to spend yet. Mm -hmm. you know, he had a, a horse racing track on his property. He had black swans. He had Aberdeen Angus bulls. He had a 24-track recording studio at a time when that was an expensive thing to have. And his shirts and suits were made in Savile Row in London. And when SEAL members annoyed him, he decided that they shouldn't have toilet tissue. That would be taken away from them. So they'd have to go and find the yellow pages in, in phone booths and steal them. It's just this. It's through the looking glass. It's exactly the opposite of what it what it says it is. Yeah. Um, so for our final reading from uh, the Gospel according to Catherine Spallini, <laughs> um, page 273. The next day I was called in for the final meeting for the Court of Ethics. I debated not going, but decided to sit through it. I had spent the day yesterday thinking about leaving the Sea Org, and instead of being convinced to do it, I had scared myself back into wanting to try harder. My whole life I've been told horror stories about how awful the wrong world is. People were not intelligent, made bad decisions, and didn't have Scientology technology to help them. What if I got sucked into that world and became a promiscuous slut who did drugs? Sorry for the words. <laughs> With these thoughts, running through my head, I decided to try to pull it together and be more on purpose. Besides, my contacts were really old and I had been trying to get a CSW approved to go to the eye doctor, but it kept getting disapproved. Maybe it was because I was too out of ethics. If I got my ethics in, maybe I could get new contacts and stop walking around with a ripped contact in one eye. At the court of ethics, I explained that I was sorry and would try harder and they seemed to accept it and told me they would issue my findings that afternoon with what I had to do to get in good standing with the group. Later that day, I scanned the paper to see what my penalty was. I had to do lower conditions and write my overts and withholds. That wasn't too bad. I had been running OW since I was a young child, so this would be easy. Yeah. So uh, and I want to explain to, to potential readers that, that you do use Scientology terms throughout, mm -hmm. so OWs and things like that, and that I don't think that that will get in the way. I think... It, it's quite natural. I would like to point out to anybody reading the book that when you were use the word nattering, that is a specific Scientology term for making critical comments. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you know, we'd, we'd hate to give people misunderstood words, wouldn't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to decide. I was like, well, I have a glossary. And I said, and I felt it was more natural to try to put the words around it so people could understand what the word meant. Mm. So, so not... that you just get taken out of the story. Yeah, I, I think you've been successful in that. I think the book is is very readable. And um, so uh, let's hope that it sells a million copies. <laughs> and uh, do, you, do you have any idea when the second book will be ready? Um, I'm hoping a lot quicker than this one. This one was something I've been working on for many years, but really worked on it the last three to four years. But okay. that was with my kids at home. They're in school now, so I have a lot more time um, I would like to say a year or two, but honestly, you got, I got to actually have it all on paper. I've started it. Hmm. I'm hoping for a year or two. I'll hmm. say. Yeah. Well, I, I wish you the best of luck and, and, and I look forward to reading it. Thank you. And I definitely will send it, send you a copy. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I so love that you read it. Like it makes me excited because I didn't know if, um, you know, I don't know. I didn't know what the target audience would, if it would interest everybody, because it is about a young girl growing up, which is very specific. But I do think, I hope I captured that world of what it's like to be a young girl through those eyes in the Church of Scientology Sea Org. Hmm. I, I think you did. I think you did a sterling job of it. And, I, you know, I, I, yes, people send me their biographies in Scientology, and no, I don't read them because you know i've got a life yeah. um and so with yours i thought well you know i have to dip into it to to see you know if there's something to to talk about here and i just found it was such an easy read that despite being bored to death 
of stories about Scientology you can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. It's been my whole life, uh, nearly 50 years now. Um, that, that, that your book is, it is fresh. It, it, it says something, and I think will give people a much better understanding of, you know, why we need to help people in Scientology rather than mm -hmm. attacking and protesting and what have you. Why we need to help the people who are trapped in it and, you know, focus the, you know, as Tony Ortega does so well, focus on David Miscavige and um, yeah. pulling his claws out, maybe. Exactly. Um, well, thank you so much, John. That means a lot to me. Great. And I, it's been and I hope been that, yeah, that people will read this and they get more of an understanding. Yeah, because most people in the Sea Org think they're saving the world and they don't, they're not mm -hmm. evil people. They are being controlled. So. Yeah, we and it's such a, an essential point that, that you know, one of the terrible things about Scientology and, and other authoritarian cult groups is that they they take some of the best people out of society, people who would otherwise do, you know, marvelous things. You know, looking at, you know, the survivors of, of Scientology, my friend Ira Chalef has become a, a leading figure in the world by writing about courageous followership that followers need to be responsible for their leaders and yes, um, intelligent that. disobedience. And his work is now being used by the US military. And this is a guy who learned about mm -hmm. dangerous leadership at first yes. hand from Ron wow. Hubbard. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's been great. Thank you very much indeed. And Thank you so um, much, everybody go out and buy the book. It's great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Hi. John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.